Hey guys, my name is Michael Sipos and I'm the UF IFAS Extension Florida Sea Grant Agent in Collier County. And today we're going to learn about the blackfin tuna. So keep on watching the video if you want to learn some life history characteristics, tips on identifying them, and uh, learn how to flay this species. And if you'd like to take the uh, survey linked in the description, it really helps us do our job, ensures that there's going to be more videos like these in the future. Um, so I'm going to move the camera and we'll get started on this. Okay, so let's get started. So here is our beautiful blackfin tuna. So to give you an idea of size of this fish, it is about 14 and 3 quarter inches from the tip of the mouth to the fork. So that's a fork measurement. And it is about 16 inches from the tip of the mouth to the tip of the tail. So that's maximum total length. And this fish weighs in at a whopping 2 pounds. Um, so the, the limit of this fish, there's no size regulations in 2020. There's a two per uh, person bag limit or a 10 per boat limit. So whatever is greater. So if you have five licensed anglers on a boat, you're allowed 10 of these uh, blackfin tuna. If you have six licensed anglers on a boat, you can have 12 on board. And that recently changed. Um, yeah, so let's give you some identification tips on how to tell this species over a different species of tunas. Um, so commonly the blackfin swims around with uh, the bonita and or the, the skipjack tuna. And those will have squiggly marks. The skipjacks will have sort of lines going down the belly. The little tunny or the bonita will have some the patterning up on top. These fish will have uh, a, a pretty long uh, pectoral fin, not as long as the albacore tuna that goes way beyond the, the second dorsal fin right here. This fish has a dorsal fin that's hidden. Th these are super cool. I mean, everything about them is about speed. So their eyes are sort of flush right there. Their fins like fold into this cool groove right there. Um, and their, their dorsal fin actually folds up. It, it flips up and it's sort of tucked in there. So these fish are bullets and they have this fusiform shape, which is a torpedo shape. Um, but another way to dis, uh, determine this species over maybe a different species, like a yellowfin tuna, is that they have a they have like a bronzish pattern over here. And even on like the, the, the second dorsal fin will be a little bit bronzish rather than like a brilliant yellow. Um, but this can also fade after being in the cooler for a little bit. So they could look a little bit more yellow rather than bronze like this one. Um, but the yellowfin tuna have longer, longer, a longer second dorsal fin. And these finnerets uh, will be also sort of light, brilliant yellow rather than a muted sort of bronze color. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to the Keys and catch this fish and uh, shout out to the family that took me out. It was an awesome experience and a little bit different than what we usually see on the west coast of Florida over here. So um, the, the Florida record for this fish is 45 pounds 8 ounces in Key West and the IGFA world record for this fish is 49 pounds 6 ounces in Marathon. So uh, I'm not sure if the world record holder applied for the Florida record when he caught that fish. But yeah, let's get started. And um, actually, uh, it, it's pretty common for tuna species to be bled. Um, I, 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 I made an incision right here by the, by the gill rakers to bleed it out. Um, people think that it, it, it increases the, the food quality of them because it releases a little bit of the lactic acid that builds up from the fighting. These fish are very active. They build up some lactic acid um, in, their, in their blood. Um, and it, it releases that that way. Some people will make an incision right past the, the, the pectoral fin right over here, and other people will sort of make an incision on the inner membrane of the perculum area. Uh, I, I like this uh, gill raker area because it doesn't really allow for entry of fresh water that could degrade the meat. Um, if you make an incision right over here and you go down in there and you put them in a cooler that has a lot of uh, fresh water ice in there, it, it could actually go into the meat and sort of degrade it, making it a little bit more mushier. So um, bleeding them out is a common method of uh, you know a lot of these pelagic kind of species. Um, so. Yep, I'll, I'll include a link to a, an article on the bottom of the description. So let's go ahead and start filleting them. And also, uh, one more, one more, one more thing on identifying them. This species actually has the fewest amount of gill rakers, uh, which are these structures on the gills, which are used for sort of filter feeding. 
Um, these fish also chase down prey and they strain plankton and small invertebrates out of the water column. So they use these, they open their mouth and they swim along and they, they, they use them to capture it and then sort of force it down in their esophagus and their throat to eat them later. So the, the blackfin tuna has about anywhere from 19 to 25. I've seen 20 to 23 gill rakers, but more uh, other species of tuna have greater amount of gill rakers. So that's one tip on identifying them. But if you have to look into there, you're probably going to kill the fish if you want to release them. So sort of use that color determination pattern and uh, start looking at your tuna species if you prepare on, or if you plan on fishing for them. So let's get started on cutting this fish and uh, filleting them. I'm going to make an incision along the back all the way towards the head. I want to try to get as much meat as possible from this really delicious fish. So I'm going to do these cuts first on either side of the dorsal fin. I'm going to feel for the soft patch where the gill plate sort of stops and the meat starts and make that incision. A little cut and start peeling back this fillet and rubbing it with my knife. Uh, pelagic species are oftentimes pretty easy to fillet because they have a pretty reduced skeleton. You'll have those pin bones in the middle, but besides that, you don't really need to resist any sort of rocky structure because they're they're swimming midwater calm. Okay, so that's, that's one part of our filet. And that is a delicious morsel. I'm going to take off the skin after I take off the other piece of the filet. So the range of this fish uh, extends from Massachusetts down to southern Brazil. It seems to be sort of the default range that a lot of these uh, western Atlantic fish inhabit. They like migrating. Uh, they, they sort of try to find the, the temperate water temperatures. In Florida, you'll see them around autumn, winter, and spring. There's they, You can in, encounter them pretty often, but that's uh, when the larger push of these migratory species come in. They like deep, clean water that's close to the coast, so that's why they're very common in the, the Keys area, in the South Florida area. And if they don't, if they don't have that water really close to the coast, they'll, they'll start, um, you'll find them around the continental shelf and anywhere where there's like a, a drop off. So I'm peeling back this filet here. And pushing it back. Boom. That's another little chunk. And this is the rest of our tuna. So there's, this is a very high yield fish. Put that there, get a little paper towel. So they're, they're pretty uh, fast growing species. There's reports of them growing up to 0.4 to 0.6 inches a month. They're not very long lived. Uh, an old tuna, uh, old blackfin tuna would be about five years old. I actually looked up age and growth data for them and I found this 2014 study that found that um, on their otoliths, which are their inner ear bones, um, they actually, in some, uh, some populations, lay down two increments, so like growth rings. Um, a lot of fish might lay down one in the winter time and then in the summertime there'll be a clear band which is faster growth and then another one in the winter time. While tropical fish and temperate fish sort of, uh, their environment doesn't change as much so it's sort of hard to age a fish that that is in a constant kind of temperature. But they found that they had two of these annuli, or not even annuli, they have to call them increments because if it was an annuli they would only lay one. Um, in the Florida Strait population, which is the area between uh, the Florida Keys and Cuba, uh, and, and they, that corresponded with their breeding seasons that they had. So they spawned twice in that area, which was about spring to summertime, and they would lay down that increment on their otolith. Yep, so that's our, our fillet right over there. You can see that bloodline that has a, a little bit more of that red muscle in there. And that's for that sustained movement that has a higher amount of myoglobin in it, which is an oxygen containing pigment. We'll put that over here and fillet do our other side here. So in that study, when they did the age and growth data, 
Um, they, they aged about 212 specimens, and this was a cool, that was a cool NSU paper, Nova Southeastern University, um, and they only, only nine were over five years old, and the rest of them were bet between the ages of one to three. Oh, so as I was talking, I messed up with the skinning of this, so we're going to have to go into triage and see if we could take care of this. I'm going to try to go from this approach and see if I could get underneath this portion to uh, skin the rest of that filet. So you watched me mess up here. <laughs> but they're super, super tasty. I'm really excited to eat this. And they're pretty sustainably managed. Um, if you look up the IUCN red list recommendation for this species, it's a species of least concern. While uh, the Monterey Bay Seafood Watch will list them as, I believe, good choices. Um, a big concern with them is just the fact that uh, the fishery can be associated with catching other species that are a little bit uh, more imperiled, like the big eye um, tuna or some piece, species of pelagic sharks, especially if they're um, using a pursane to catch them, which is a net that sort of goes around a whole school of fish and traps them. So if you're doing hook and line, you're able to um, sort of determine which species that you, you would like to release rather than sort of grabbing all the species in one big net throw. So it's a pretty good species of uh, seafood to eat if you're concerned with sustainability of a, uh, a tuna. So I'm just shaving the top portion of the filet since I missed it on the first run around. But that's okay, because that gives us a little bit more opportunity to talk about this fish. <laughs> <laughs> so, these fish, um, they will eat, like I said, they'll chase fish and invertebrates, squid, crustaceans, stomatopods, shrimp, um, around the surface of the water, but they'll also be um, a little bit deeper. They're epipelagic and mesopelagic, but they enjoy feeding near the top. And uh, they, they chase them and they also feed by straining. So they'll use those gill rakers to um, trap smaller plankton and funnel that towards their mouth. Which was interesting enough that, that, that this uh, species of blackfin tuna has the least amount of gill rakers considering it's one of the smaller species of tuna out there in the Atlantic. Um, so you, you would imagine it eating a smaller food particle. So after I took the skin off, I'm going to go ahead and find these pin bones. I'm going to feel them with my finger and then cut them out. And then I'm going to trim up that red meat along the edge. So here's one cut. Here's one cut. Cut those out. And I am actually going to try to get some of that red meat that you see there and there. So that's a little associated with a little stronger flavor. And I like a more mild tuna. So I'm gonna cut that out. That is perfect. And I am gonna trace that out on this side. And it's perfect. There. So I have a little bit here, but I could cut that out when I'm actually eating it or do that right now. Boom. That is a delicious little filet right there. So like I said, this species spawns in the Florida Strait. It just depends on where the populations are located since they're in such a large area. They spawn in the spring and summertime in the Florida Straits. The Gulf of Mexico population might have a, uh, a different spawning period. And the eggs are, they, they don't really know too, too much about maybe like the fecundity of the species, which is the amount of eggs they expel. They just know that they're, they're buoyant and uh, they'll hatch and within about 11 millimeters the larvae will have a, a vertebral a full vertebral column and about 20 millimeters the larvae will have all the fin rays uh, associated with its fins so not the spines but the fin rays um, and then at about 28 millimeters there'll be some pigment with uh, associated with that larvae and the eggs are buoyant 
and they're pelagic, so they sort of float around in the water column. And they've found those larvae from the surface all the way down to about 164 feet. And uh, so I looked at that age and growth paper that I'm actually going to link to the description. And a uh, one year old fish is approximately 17.75 inches to the fork. A three year old fish, which most of those fish that were caught in that study, that 212 specimen study, was uh, between the one to three year old uh, mark. And that is about a 25 and a half inch of fish at the fork. So it gives you a little idea of how fast these species grow. So these are all our fillets here. I'm excited to cover them in sesame oil and sear them on a cast iron and it will be delicious. <laughs> so uh, thanks so much. Please take that survey linked in the description and let us know how we did. And um, yeah, just tune in for more fish fillet videos. Thank you guys.